it's, it's a, a pleasure to welcome everyone to the Eisenhower Presidential Library, Museum, and Boyer at Home. And like I always do, I'll try to reiterate that it is your presidential library. And we're pleased that we have so many wonderful people living in the area community that provide support for the many programs that we have here at the uh, library. So on behalf of the Eisenhower Foundation and the staff of the Eisenhower Presidential Library, we want to say thank you to, to all our donors who have provided funding for this program and other programs associated with the D-Day weekend. So thank you very much on that. Um, those, those in the um, in our audience today have just watched the Richard Boys documentary. Now that you have seen the story, I am pleased to introduce one of the Richard Boys to you. It's one of the Richard Boys that I've known for a number of years and have a, a great respect for him. Dr. Günther or, or Guy Stern was born in, in uh, born 1922 in Hildesheim, Germany, was the only member of his family of five who escaped and immigrated to the USA in 1937. He was drafted into the US Army and sent to Camp Richard to become a POW interrogator. Two days after D-Day, he arrived in Germany to interrogate German prisoners. He later received a bronze star for his quote unquote method of mass interrogation. After Germany's surrender, he learned that his family perished in the Warsaw Ghetto. Guy became a professor of German language and literature at Columbia University. Today, he is distinguished professor for German at Wayne State University in Detroit. Dr. Sharon is also the director of the Institute of Rights Righteous at the Holocaust Memorial Center in Greater Detroit. Following Dr. Sharon's presentation, we will have some time for questions. Please raise your hand and a, and a microphone will be brought to you. Th again, this program is being filmed, so please wait for the microphone before asking your question. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Dr. Sharon a warm Kansas welcome. I need, to, I need to ask one question or make one statement. Please turn off your cell phone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carl, for that very handsome introduction. Uh, and what you indeed see here is what's left of uh, former Master Sergeant Guy Stern, <laughs> whom you have already encountered in the movie with some hair still on him when he was interrogating. <laughs> uh, when the uh, film, The Ritchie Boys, was first shown in the United States, a close relative of mine made the observation for that from now on, I would be tagged one of the Ritchie Boys as my exclusive label. Well, I said, uh, I don't mind. But what about my 50 years of teaching, researching, and writing? Forget it, she said. If posterity should by chance remember you, it'll be as a Ritchie boy. <laughs> uh, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, fellow veterans, as I stand here, that tag seems to be a wonderful designation. Perhaps all of us who served in World War II rose above ourselves to a task that needed doing. But when we sometimes get tagged with an additional label that we were heroes, I would say that label belongs more rightly to those who bore the first brunt of attacks, our frontline troops. And so I would like to ask my fellow veterans of World War II to take that label on and stand, please. Don't be shy. I feel proud. Can you all hear me way in the back? Sit down, Guy. Have a seat. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
frankly, uh, I feel proud and honored to be asked to be a speaker at this occasion and this location. I'm also grateful to Camp Ritchie because this camp amply prepared us for assignment abroad. There was no aspect of our work for which the teachers at Camp Ritchie had not trained us. I tested this conviction on fellow Ritchie boys who came to our reunion and, our, uh, and the first showing of our exhibit at the Holocaust Museum uh, on the Ritchie Boys, a project launched by our director, Mr. Goldman, who is with us today, I believe, both for that reason, but also in honor of his father, who served on D -Day, from D-Day 1 to the end of the war as a commander of a field hospital caring for the wounded soldiers. Take a bow. <laughs> Let me give one specific example of that training I mentioned. Uh, it, the main assignment for many of us, the film made that clear, was the interrogation of prisoners of war. In the mock interrogations which we had to practice, we learned essentially five methods of extracting information. Incidentally, our guinea pigs were, for, were captured uh, men of the Africa Corps who were shipped to Camp Ritchie and told to either withhold information if they if we acted stupidly vis-a-vis -vis them, or to give out the story with which they had been prompted if we asked the right questions. Uh, the, uh, so we were taught right through those nine weeks how to use the best method of interrogation. There were five essential approaches. One of them was to display superior Superior knowledge, that means we made it appear the answers we expected we already knew and we tossed all sorts of information that seemed rather discreet and unknown to anybody else beyond their units at them. And so they thought, well, what the heck? Why, not, why make life tough for myself? They already know. That was method one. Method two was playing buddy-buddy, making them forget that actually we were enemies. So, uh, one, uh, so what fitted me best, I was a fanatical follower of, of the soccer leagues in Germany, and so uh, an, an important interrogation that came to me, I had to find out something about the industrial complex in the city of Düsseldorf. So I didn't start out that way at all. I said to him, uh, hey, I'm glad I got somebody from, your, from Dusseldorf because I'm puzzled. At, the, at half, in half season, you fellows at Fortuna Dusseldorf were at the head of the league and now you're near the cellar. What on earth happened? Oh, he said, yeah, you know, Jensen, our national, uh, our national defense back, he was drafted, and then he gave me a whole litany. It's not whiskey. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, he gave me a whole litany of what happened to his team, and then slowly I led to the question that was real, I was really charged to ask. And he never really realized that a fellow soccer fan could be the enemy. That was just an example. And so each one of us played his own role in trying to make the prisoner forget the adversary stance between us. The third one was to, was to be very kind. Uh, I never smoked in my life, 
Uh, I took out a pack of cigarettes at one time when I knew the prisoners had been, had been short on supplies for a long time, or a can of, yeah, I'll mention it, sea rations, veterans, uh, not all that tasty, but when you're hungry. So uh, I pulled out one of those, and uh, uh, then he would say, oh, oh could, could I have a cigarette, please? Oh, I said, sure, you can have the whole pack, but then, you know, we got to cooperate, and uh, that's fine. There was a third method. The fourth method was uh, simply to let them speak and then latch on to one remark that gave you an opening. And the fifth one was, which we also had learned, but not in detail, was to play on their sense of anxiety, fear, and apprehension. For example, uh, one of the toughest interrogations we did during, throughout the war was following the uh, questionnaire by our Air Force. What they wanted to know, especially when aerial photographies had not been very revealing, what they wanted is to know the results of their bombing attack, whether a second one was necessary. For example, uh, let's say on, on the ball bearing factory in Schweinfurt, Germany. And so I, he uh, would, I, the Air Force wanted to know, we hear that particular factory, very important to the German war effort, has been relocated. But where is it? What are the landmarks? What are, uh, are the railroad, tra the uh, 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 ancillary railroad tracks still re leading to the main line? And if you ask a question like that, what are the landmarks for that factory? Even the dumbest PW <laughs> couldn't be fooled into anything. He knew we were going to want to bomb. You have finished the sentence. Uh, so uh, here then, uh, I, uh, we played on fear. We had learned very early, since D-Day, that one of the methods, uh, one of the fe greatest fears of the Germans was captivity in Russian hands. So we played on that. My friend Fred Howard and I teamed up for those cases and Fred would play the soft-hearted American flowing over with the milk of human kindness and would ask him questions and the prisoner would say, well, I cannot answer that. He had good reason because frequently some of his best friends or his family were working in that very ball-bearing factory, so he refused. And then Fred would say, oh, I'm so sorry, you are not cooperating, but we have here, I have orders since last month that any prisoner who doesn't cooperate will be turned over to our Russian allies. And they had been victimized by their own propaganda. The, Rus the German propaganda had stressed if you let yourself fall into Russian captivity, you will be sent to Siberia or to the salt mines, or you will be starved. All sorts of fears would go through his head. And then Fred would take the prisoner, go over to my interrogation tent. <clears throat> Mine had been adorned with a big sign in, in three languages, <clears throat> Commissar Krukov, liaison officer. <laughs> well, how did I assume that role, especially since I don't speak Russian? <clears throat> I, I had heard uh, a radio program on the Eddie Cantor show featuring a, a, an actor who called himself the Mad Russian. I put that into my German and thereby created the voice. And secondly, <clears throat> I had taken, exchanged uniform parts from liberated Russian prisoners <clears throat> and, rid and taken away from German prisoners their little trophies whom they had taken from Russian PWs 
which were medals and uh, distinctions and stuff, put all that on myself and became my alternate uh, personality, Commissar Krukov. <laughs> and so uh, when Fred brought in that prisoner, I first had a uh, uh, sort of seizure of hysteria saying, oh my God, what a specimen you're bringing me here. He won't even survive the transport. I, I've never figured out how we would get him from the West Front to the East Front, but neither had he. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I had a sign in my tent that said uh, to my loyal friend and fellow, uh, fellow struggler, uh, Commissar Krukov, and it was signed by S Comrade Stalin. <laughs> uh, of course, Comrade Stalin didn't know about that. <laughs> uh, it had been, had been signed by one of our intelligence personnel who knew Russian, but it worked. And so many times that was the only way we could satisfy the demands of the Air Force for accurate information and uh, we got several unit citations for that information which we brought to their doorsteps. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we, the, uh, we added one more method and that was not taught at Camp Ritchie and that was the recruitment of uh, prisoners, mostly deserters, whom we could check through secret contacts that they were absolutely anti-fascist and that, we, that they were interested in our cause. And they became uh, our wonderful uh, revelatory uh, partners in, in, in interrogating prisoners and getting information. So I, I'll give you one example which is particularly striking towards the end of the war, how inventive these trustees, as we called them, uh, could become. One of, one of them, his name was Korn, uh, he was outraged at the Nazis. They had ruined his family and he was cleared. And so uh, we had an inquiry from the judge advocate office uh, uh, one of our pilots had bailed out and a lieutenant uh, of an infantry, div a German infantry division ordered him shot the moment he hit the ground. That's a war crime. So we were told if he gets into captivity because he had been identified by a fellow uh, soldier of his unit, uh, get, get the evidence on him. Well, that wasn't easy. We got, a, we found him among our list roster of prisoners and I uh, interrogated him and he shut up. He said, I did nothing of the kind, that's not true and so forth. We couldn't get any further than the evidence we already had. So Korn said, leave me alone with him for a moment. We were then uh, a, a billeted into a ceramic factory uh, on, uh, on the uh, right side of the Rhine. And so uh, we had put him in, into sort of a confinement in that within the factory. And so Korn went into it and in the morning he came out with all the information we needed. And we said, how on earth have you done that? He said, I used a little stratagem. He went into that room and, and uh, there was, was some hooks there on the wall and he took off his belt and he started to hang himself. So the lieutenant said, what on earth are you doing? He said, well, I tell you, I, I have some offenses that they hold against me and they are not going to be gentle and so I want to uh, end it all right now. And the lieutenant said, don't do that. Just sweat it out. That's what I am doing. You know, they think I shot that pilot. Well, and then 
uh, and corn wasn't moved. He started again to hang himself. Finally, the lieutenant blurted out his own offense and corn had it. We sent it to the judge advocate and as best I know, the lieutenant was executed for war crimes. So these were helpful people. That was another method we developed. We used a combination of all those to uh, extract information of also from one of the first revealed war criminals, a man by the name of Dr. Schubel, who was involved in the so-called euthanasia program in uh, Russia and Poland and uh, had killed at that time early in the extermination program via morphine injections, had killed over thousands of prisoners, him, uh, or, or rather of uh, confined people himself. So uh, we were able to, by, uh, various, by various devices, to get him as well to confess. So uh, this, however, came late in the war. That was not our primary function. Yet this report is the only one we ever uh, issued that was shared with the public at large. And if you want to look in your computer on details of this, our first revelation of a, of a war crimes, uh, of a massive cri war crimes murderer, uh, it's the first May issue uh, of Time Magazine of 1945. So you'll hear and see uh, for the first time that our activities were brought to the public. Now, you might well ask after seeing the movie, and I'm glad the movie is somewhat silent on this because it would really possibly stretch uh, our merits, uh, that uh, it doesn't dwell on what we really accomplished. And, but uh, we did have, a, have good evidence that our task was not in vain. We had a second reunion uh, in Washington, D.C., and our main speaker was a historian in military intelligence, uh, in a member of military intelligence, a high-ranking officer, and he had investigated our reports and said that 67% of viable information needed for the war effort came from the Ritchie boys. And that was reward enough. Uh, now, uh, we uh, had many other uh, responsibilities. Uh, for example, uh, I was in charge of the survey section, which uh, was separate from what most of my uh, fellow Ritchie boys did. Many of them <coughs> kept track of one division or one unit at our front lines, got the latest developments and reported them to higher headquarters. But mine was called survey section, which meant we got a questionnaire from various army units in which they wanted to know information. For example, there was a questionnaire by the Transportation uh, Corps. Uh, they were surprised after our Air Force hit the tracks of the German railroad and the rolling stock. What happened frequently is a couple of days later, they were fully equipped and fully running again. How did they? Uh, uh, how did they repair the tracks and the ro uh, rolling stock so quickly? And then I did a survey asking dozens of former members of the railroad force uh, and uh, railroaders and transportation, uh, 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 transportation officers. And what we found out, the answer is one word, prefab. They had, could shove it right in after we had destroyed some of their equipment. Uh, or 
there was, towards the end of the war, we got a questionnaire from the Surgeon General. They said, our troops are coming more and more in close contact with the German troops. Are there any uh, diseases that could take epidemic forms uh, if caught by our troops? Well, so we uh, interrogated all their medics and sent in the report. But these were all discrete assignments asking for the input of various groups of prisoners whom our screeners then selected for uh, interrogation. Uh, I'll give one more example because it leads into some of our other assignments. Uh, we were asked to uh, judge the effectiveness of our propaganda leaflets. We uh, send them over by shells. I have one of them that is still seared by the shooting. Uh, some were tossed out of airplanes trying to uh, lessen the resistance of German forces or to get soldiers to surrender. Uh, it was, uh, some were effective, some were far too, they were over the head of the Germans because some of our uh, devices of propaganda leaflets uh, as came out of high rank of academics. <laughs> you know, well. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, we, this was one of our other responsibilities is to correct or draft propaganda leaflets. Yet another one was to read uh, German documents and if they contained, uh, captured documents, if they contained information that was of vital interest, then we would forward it. One of the, uh, my uh, most interesting one was when a German deserter came with excellent detailed information in the form of a diary uh, written in shorthand. Fortunately, uh, my parents had made me get up while I was going to high school and go to one hour early to take a class in German shorthand, and that's the first time it ever paid off. <laughs> uh, the last time, too. <laughs> uh, then, uh, as the most uh, interesting and innovative personal uh, introduction of interrogation was uh, mass interrogation, which Ritchie had strictly uh, asked us not to use because prisoners tend to reinforce their own resistance towards talking. So, uh, but then, a questionnaire came uh, which I knew could not be answered by detailed questioning of singular uh, prisoners. That was towards the end of the war and German, uh, the German army uh, on orders of Hitler had drawn the last remnants of manpower into their force. That meant the lame, the halt, one was called the stomach battalion because they were all stomach sick and had to have special diets. All of these, the 15 year olds, the 65 year olds were now drafted. And our G1 sent a memo down to our cage saying, what can we expect of them? We have no information on these newly created uh, divisions like the 62nd People's Assault Division. It was neither the people nor assault, but that uh, propaganda does a lot to uh, get overaged men look representable. But so I knew I couldn't get any information by single interrogations. So I, when the prisoners came in from the, say, the 62nd Division, I would say, fall out. <laughs> Yes, with emphasis. <laughs> uh, I said, uh, fall out and would say, uh, first regiment on the left, 
second regiment here, the signal battalion over there, and so forth and so on. And these people, scarcely trained, not security minded for a moment, did exactly as told. I had one of our trustees, a very tough uh, uh, first sergeant, help me in if there was anybody who refused, he would take them down a step or two, and we got, and then I said, how many of you were trained with a machine gun? Hands up. And, uh, and this sergeant would take down the numbers, and uh, then I would ask, uh, how many of you uh, have had artillery training? And then the most crucial question of all from G1 because you remember how World War I ended in gas warfare. And that was the G1 wanted to know, is the enemy capable of finishing this war again through gas warfare? A great worry on the minds of all the commanding officers. So uh, I asked, how many of you have gas masks with you? Because you have to protect your own troops, of course. How many of you have gone through a gas chamber, took that down? And then I sent a statistical report uh, the first day uh, over to headquarters. Next morning, there was a call from, uh, from uh, G G2 uh, saying, Sergeant Stern to report to of a warrant officer Gold tomorrow morning. I didn't know what I had done. He was uh, our paymaster. I hadn't done anything funny with money. So uh, I reported to him and he said, you know, this afternoon I have been ordered to teach you statistics. It's the most uh, condensed course I've ever had, but it served the purpose. And uh, I suspect that one of the reasons when all my information proved accurate uh, for my decoration of a bronze star uh, rested to some extent on, on getting these figures to our higher headquarters. Uh, now, uh, uh, we uh, have to draw, uh, I have been given 25 minutes. How many have you used up? Huh? Go on. go on. I have orders to go on. <laughs> uh, so uh, if, if we uh, did one more. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, tell a few uh, stories now that really the film couldn't tell. And uh, uh, for, uh, I, I would like to bring up four points that a 90-minute film with all the good techniques of Christian Bauer, he couldn't tell. And that is, number one, how was this film, how did it happen that this film was made not by an American filmmaker, but by a German? You know, you must have wondered when you saw all the credits. Many of them were credits to Germans. And so I can tell the story. I had been uh, on another research mission in Germany. And uh, somebody told me uh, that, uh, a, uh, that I should look up a filmmaker who uh, wanted to know more about World War I and uh, intelligence work. So I, I thought, well, that's interesting. And I found myself in the studio of two f German filmmakers, one of them Christian Bauer. And what happened now is a story of uh, a chain of coincidences that I would not tell because it seems so unlikely unless I had people who were with me. I get, uh, I get to his studio, and he says to me, um, okay, uh, I am toying with the idea of making a film about the Ritchie boys. I said, how do you know about the Ritchie boys? He said, well, 
I have been interested in the, uh, particularly in the Jewish immigrants and their fate in America for, a, for various reasons. And he said, uh, start out by telling me a story about your experiences. So I tell him a story. Uh, I had been uh, a member of an athletic club in my hometown. And uh, so uh, one day in 1934, I was unceremoniously kicked out because there's a big difference whether you uh, do the uh, giant turn uh, or if you, the way you straddle the horse, whether you do that in a Christian or Jewish way, that's a difference. So they wanted it done in a certain way, I guess. But at any rate, I got kicked out. And now I am checking after we, the so-called fillets Argentan gap, where we almost captured the entire retreating German army after our breakthrough uh, from out of the Normandy beaches. And uh, so I uh, look through that one of uh, look through dozens of pay books, and I find the name uh, Günther Halm, not very frequent, but not a rarity either. I thought, well, it's, I, had a, I had a fellow who was in my club, in fact, in the same subdivision, uh, whose name was that. So I said to myself, uh, well, uh, could it be? And yes, I said to Christian Bauer, it was somebody uh, from my own club in my own hometown, and I, I interrogated him in the dead of night because uh, we were not allowed to give away our identity under any circumstances. So uh, he said, oh, that's interesting. He said, uh, and uh, where was, where, what town are you from? And I said, Hildesheim. He almost jumped out of his chair. Remember, we are in southern Germany. My hometown is way up in the north. And I, he says, Hildesheim? I said, yeah, it's a medium-sized town in the north. He said, I know all about your hometown. He said, and this question floored me. He said, were you in the Jewish elementary school in Hildesheim? I, I was flabbergasted. I said, how do you know? There were only about 30 kids in that, and we had one instructor for all of the classes in one schoolroom. You know that kind of setup. So he said, I said, yes, I was, but, and he said, then you must have known my mother. And, and I said, no, there was no girl by the name of Bauer. He said, nonsense, he was shouting at me. Uh, her name was Van Rossen. And I said, Eva van Russen. And he said, yes. He jumps up out of his chair, and he, I said, what are you doing? And he, I, I'm calling my mother. And we had, I mustn't draw this story out too long, uh, we had, we were in a restaurant the next day. She came down from Upper Bavaria. We, reminisced about old times. She was the only Catholic girl in our school, and she told me why she was in our school. You can ask questions about that if you wish. And uh, then Christian had heard of her, from her, of her schoolmates and how she missed them, and what her fate had been because her father had sent her to a Jew school. And so then Christian said, I got to see to that, that this film is made, if it's nothing else except for my mother. And so uh, that is the genesis of that film. The second thing I would like to discuss with you just briefly is my particular uh, a relationship, no, that's exaggerated, I would say, my thinking of General Eisenhower. After all, that is his memorial here. Uh, we were, <coughs> we were uh, our team 
was involved in the planning of the invasion on a very minor key in Bristol, which was one of the planning areas. And uh, so General Eisenhower would frequently come down. Uh, General Omar Bradley was in charge um, with uh, his adjutant was General Hodges, who later on became the commandant of the First Army. And so that's in Bristol. I occasionally saw the general. And he seemed completely uh, in charge. He was self-assured. And, you know, I didn't talk to him, but, you know, you make inferences if you are in intelligence. This <laughs> The uh, second thing, I think even the vaunted researchers at this wonderful library and its wonderful staff don't know about. Uh, you have seen that uh, in the film that there were uh, uh, Germans who were skilled in English who were infiltrating our lines, many of them exposed and shot as spies. The, uh, but is not known that the same unit, it was called Einheit Stielau, which meant a uh, fighting group under, uh, under Colonel Stielau, was also charged with an assassination attempt on, President, on General Eisenhower. And uh, we were able to report that. We did, nobody made much of it. I found it only in, mentioned in one history book in Germany, but there were, these were determined people determined to do evil. And the third is we found, uh, we found a, uh, a man for, uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. He is a lawyer there for the university. His father was also a Ritchie boy, and in his papers, he found a picture of his father, the Ritchie boy, with General Eisenhower at the order of concentration camp. He's standing right next to him as his interpreter. And when Eisenhower gave his memorable speech that we must not ever let anybody distort the truth about the concentration camps, his interpreter was one of our boys. And finally, uh, a very funny incident. Uh, I was, uh, I entered Columbia University at the same time, uh, somebody somewhat superior to me, by the name of Eisenhower, also entered Columbia University, but not as a graduate student, but as its president, as you know. And so uh, I would pass him occasionally, and at one time, out of instinct, I didn't talk to him, obviously. So out of instinct, one time, instead of saying, good morning, sir, or something like that, or good morning, president, I did this. He didn't respond in kind. He just said, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I display with pride uh, on my office wall my master's certificate, which I earned during the time that General President Eisenhower was at Columbia. He signed my master's diploma, uh, and so I, I hold that kind of deal. The third thing uh, I ought to mention is that you, from the film and from my remarks, you might have gotten an exaggerated picture of uh, us as absolutely beyond anything bad or doing something wrong. Well, uh, let me tell you two incidents which answer two questions I frequently get. The one question is, were there any Afri uh, Afro-American soldiers at Camp Ritchie? And the answer is yes, the head of our rec that's for you lay people, is recreation hall, has nothing to do with wrecking, so we did that too. But uh, the, uh, at our recreation hall, the sergeant in charge was a very imposing looking uh, 
an Afro-American sergeant, and one time I had reason to talk to him together with another Richie boy. We were disputing who had winners at the ping pong table. A war, war important argument ensued, and so somebody who was getting impatient to get to play said, come on, uh, have the sergeant straightened out. We went to him, and he looked at us, and he said, you know, you fellows, you are in intelligence, but intelligence isn't in you. <laughs> So uh, uh, we settled it by, <laughs> kind of shamefaced, settled it by tossing a coin. And then I found out later who this sergeant was. They had sent him to Ritchie because he fit all the requirements, language skills, German cultural knowledge, sophisticated man, and it turned out it was uh, William Warfield, one of the, arguably, one of the best baritones of his generation. And if you go into a record store, uh, you will always find a copy, at least, of that, uh, of uh, Old Man River uh, in, uh, on, on, uh, in, in the store. He was married uh, for a while to Kathleen Battle, another great in opera, so uh, I, uh, had my, myself taken down by a very uh, esteemed member of our society. But the second question is, were there any women at Camp Ritchie? Yes, we had a company of wax, and I found out, I found out by accident when I was a uh, feature editor at my, other, my previous undergraduate college, that we two were both on the school newspaper and we became good friends with Richie memories. Um, now, uh, finally, <coughs> when I uh, add all of that up, I can only say it was an incredible, wonderful experience for all of us. But I have to end it all with yet putting a little bit of a doubt in my mind. We were not, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow veterans will tell their families, none of us were really perfect. And so I'll tell you a story of one of our rather defaulting members of the Ritchie Boys. Uh, I'll call him Paul, because that was his name. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, we nicknamed him P Shortcut Paul. He took shortcuts in life, you know what I mean, and he took shortcuts on the road. One day in the field, we were asked to, uh, uh, bring, a, uh, to, to bring a message to headquarters, secret papers, and uh, we were coming back to our uh, encampment and uh, Immediately, Paul at the wheel piped up, listen, I know a shortcut. <laughs> he took it, and then we heard voices. These were not English voices. <laughs> so we hear those Germans, and our ranking non comp shouts at Paul, get us the hell, he would use stronger language, uh, <laughs> out of here, so he backs up the Jeep, and the Jeep stalls. <laughs> and uh, our ranking non-com, Kurt, got really uh, angry, and he said, uh, what's wrong? Out of gas. But you got that canister in, in the back. Yes, uh, but I traded with a uh, Norman, Normandy farmer for some Calvados. The, ca the canister was filled with, cal with Calvados liqueur, and so Kurt shouted, put the Calvados in the tank. <laughs> he did, and miracle of miracles, the Jeep started, 
and we got back safely. So uh, his, some, some of our adventures were not heroic and they were very human, but we all, all veterans, all of us in that army of World War II pulled on the same string and it's my feeling today if I can draw any lesson that what we need in this country is the same feeling of unity of purpose and patriotism that the civilians and the soldiers displayed at that time. Thank you. My general now. <laughs> we have about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So if you got a question for Dr. Stern, please raise your hand and you will go to that person. Speak directly to the microphone, please. Speak loudly. Sir, in interrogating the uh, German prisoners, did you notice any? difference in uh, elite German units like the SS as opposed to regular units? Were they more resistant well, to answering your questions Thanks. or uh, supporting the Nazis? The question was, Guy, if you uh, saw any difference between uh, the interrogation results and, of course, the interrogation methods you used when you were dealing with officers as opposed to uh, soldiers? No, not officers. The SS. The SS. Short stuff. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, uh, if uh, we have used in the past, as you know from various reports, we have used uh, physical violence against uh, captive, uh, presumed terrorists. Uh, I uh, the one of the very first lessons we got in interrogation methods was never touch a prisoner. And uh, that was, that absolutely prevailed. Uh, I have reason to think that, uh, that the mistreatment of prisoners has very deleterious effects for our country. It, for one, the most uh, obvious one is if we tr mistreat tr prisoners, they will take that as a pretext for mistreating our captives. And that's, uh, we don't certainly want to protect whom we can. Secondly, we stand in the world as breakers of our own treaties. Thirdly, uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, way of, if you mistreat a prisoner, the answers you get are likely to be uh, unreliable. Uh, if I face you, sir, I, I don't take that personally. <laughs> uh, if I face you with a barking dog and I say, isn't it true that your mother is a fanatic vegetarian? <laughs> You'll say yes, <laughs> right? Yeah. I got consent. So <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I'm not in agreement with uh, violating prisoners. I think the question was more when interrogating SS officers or SS as opposed oh, yes. to the line as opposed to line infantry, was there a difference in response, a difference in your approach? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, I'm trying to search my memory and I think the answer is mixed. Uh, in the first part of the war, uh, when we needed information, and that was primary, uh, we did not distinguish between the, say, SS division, death head, as one of them was called, or uh, bodyguard Adolf Hitler. 
But later on, when we had heard of all the outrages they committed, it uh, would, uh, you were tempted to shout earlier if you had a recalcitrant prisoner. But again, violence was not the answer. Other question? Right, the young lady right there. <laughs> Would you tell us the story about the Catholic girl in the, your Jewish school? Tell the story of your girlfriend, the Catholic girl in your Jewish, Jewish school. <laughs> why she was in a Catholic school and why she was in a Jewish school as a Catholic girl. Okay. Uh, her, her name, as I said, was Eva von Rossen. And uh, uh, she, uh, she, when she entered uh, a, a large Catholic school, uh, she, uh, she uh, was a wallflower and she, was, she didn't develop. And her father, who was a fairly well-known regional painter, very sensitive as an artist, and to his girl, uh, he saw that. So he went around town from one school to the next and interviewed or had conversations with the teachers. And finally, he hit upon this master teacher who could get five, six classes, unruly classes, satisfied, and still be sensitive and nice. He, his, uh, he got this, fellow, uh, this teacher, Oscar, and those two gentlemen hit it off, and he said, that's where my girl will go. And she flourished there. And uh, she, when we talked in this uh, restaurant, Roma, in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Munich, she, uh, she said, you know, I was, I, I just blossomed. I, I came out of myself. And when the Nazis came to power uh, and, uh, and the school was closed and all that, I was like a fish out of water again. And our father, who, never, who had had several uh, assignments as a painter from, from the city council, was given none again because he had sent his girl to a Jew school. And so uh, she had heard nothing of her fellow students. And when we met, uh, we sort of fell into each other's arms. And she asked what happened to uh, Fritz. And I told her he's in Australia. And, uh, and uh, Robert died at Auschwitz. And uh, Gerda got to New York, another one to Switzerland. Uh, you know, we were so emotional at that point. Uh, my wife, uh, my late wife, accompanied uh, me and also f uh, bowered it, and they just left us. And so uh, that's the story of, uh, of my... Uh, she, uh, she incidentally <coughs> maintained, uh, and I don't know whether justly so, uh, that I frequently looked around at her. <laughs> In the back of the room. Yeah, was there what suburb? There's another one up front there. How much planning and uh, why why were you able to immigrate to the United States? How did you come here, guy? How did you come to the United States? What planning and what efforts? I know the answer, but. Uh, <laughs> my parents had applied to a German Jewish agency in, uh, in uh, Germany. They forwarded that uh, to another agency uh, in America. But that's the tail end of the story. I had an uncle in uh, St. Louis, and uh, he, however, at the tail end of the Depression, uh, had, lo had lost his job. He was a baker and a pastry maker, 
and uh, had lost his job, so he wasn't, it wasn't sufficient that he uh, would give me the, give me the, the so-called affidavit assuring that I would not become a public charge. And so this other organization stepped in and I didn't find out about that other uh, organization consisted mainly of uh, uh, Jewish women uh, until two years ago when somebody found a list of those who were saved by that committee at the Library of Congress. So my uh, knowledge of myself was, uh, was very sketchy, as I turned out. I thought my uncle had done it and a very well-meaning council in Hamburg because the council's call, as well as our foreign office, was honeycombed with anti-Semites who didn't want any Jews to come in. So I thought this combination of somebody who broke the rules of the State Department plus my uncle's goodwill had brought me to the United States. But it was, in addition, a very fine group of Jewish women in the United States. That organization still currently meets, the, of the, the organization of these children, the organization is called 1,000 Children, because approximately 1,000 uh, youngsters came. Guy was among the oldest of them. And uh, these were women, mostly social workers, who said that we've got to be able to get together and somehow we can save children from Germany in their efforts, uh, plus a little exaggeration of how well off the uncle was and a little exaggeration of how capable Guy was. <laughs> they made it here in the United States and the rest, as they say, is history. But the most interesting part to me is uh, I've only known Guy five years. I've only been at the Holocaust Center five years. But he had no idea that he was one of the 1,000 children. An organization, I've been in the Holocaust Museum business 25 years, and that was the first I had heard of the 1,000 children. So he was saved by a bunch of Jewish housewives, essentially, uh, brought here to the United States, and he's become a, a world-renowned professor, became a hero of World War II, one of the Ritchie boys, and one of the finest soldiers and one of the finest men I know. Bless all of you, and I hope this commemoration uh, stays with you, not because of the speeches you hear, but of the spirit that hovers over this museum. <laughs>